So yesterday was the only fun part of the week with the demo of the robot. Uh, the rest of the week will be boring talks. Um, <laughs> I'm starting, <laughs> amazing. The, we, we are starting, so I don't know if uh, if Chavi explained yesterday, but the idea of the whole, the organization of the talks is that in the spring project, as you know, we've been building this really complex system to have like autonomous robots working with elderly patients in an hospital. And we've decided to organize the, the whole week by themes, looking at, at each and every part of the big system with like every time like someone from the project, so in that case, in for this first talk myself, and an invited speaker from the community that will provide another perspective on the same topic. And we thought with Xavi that would actually make sense to start by the end. And the end in a project like this one is the, the job of putting together all the pieces on the robot to get them to work. So usually in terms of like work packages, when you build like European projects or projects in general, you would always have a last work package called the technical integration or something like that, which is very technical indeed. So not very science-y in some sense. But we thought it would make sense to start with that because that will give you the whole picture. So you will immediately see why we are then splitting things in those blocks and how they, they, they talk to each other. So I'm going to spend a short amount of time, like 20 minutes, going over this architecture. That's why it's called architecture there. And then um, I will hand over the microphone to, to Mark and Ida, who will uh, give another view on what it means to build a complex autonomous system on, on robots. So I'm Severin Le Ménian, and um, in this project, I'm one of the two uh, member of the industry. So I, I work in a company called PAL Robotics. My background is in academia. Until two years ago, I was professor in the in the UK. Uh, been working a lot on social robotics, on child robot interaction. Some um, I, some of the colleagues here, uh, we've been working together in in different projects. So I speak the academic language, if you want. But today, I'm also the one selling the robots. And Ari, the robot you've seen you've seen yesterday, is produced by this company, Par Robotics, that is based in Barcelona, in Spain. Um, and it's also the reason why I'm in charge, I, I was in, or I'm still in charge in the project of integrating things or making sure that everything integrates together nicely on the robot. So it's a more kind of engineering focused job. So what does it take to build an autonomous robot? I just told you a minute ago uh, that I was going to talk about the kind of the technology behind it. But a long time ago, uh, I was working with a colleague, Paul Baxter. Um, and good friend as well and he's very like he's a very cognitive person and so we were like, arguing about what are cognitive architectures i'm sure you've all heard about cognitive architectures and and we, we were fighting about about that because he was telling me well the the, the point of if you want an autonomous system that is intelligent or intelligent whatever that means you need to build that from principles from from cognitive principles that will drive your behaviors your the generation of motion drive your perception of the world the models you're going to use and i was well back in the days i was i was young and full of energy but i was more interested in coding things so i said well yes that's fine but what i want to do is also put all those little boxes together to get something to work on the robot and i was maybe less i was i was taking a little less this cognitive stance so I'm showing just this slide because I think it really sets, sets the stage nicely for what we call an architecture. The general idea is, of course, not to do only one or the other. You need to do both. And you would typically like build, ex extract, identify those principles from evidence and typically from social sciences, psychology, but also sometimes like neuroscience, for instance, come up with principles, then implement a computational, implement, a computational model of your robot that will text like what you want to do, of course, as a context, and then a long list of specific functions. And I did mention boxes. You will see what I mean by boxes in a, in a minute, but like usually we build them a little boxes that we connect with arrows representing the flows of data between different boxes. So a lot of that. Then you run an experiment, you deploy it to the, to the, to the field, what we've done in spring in the hospital, and usually you do that again. So you evaluate, re-evaluate your principles, your models, and try again. Now, now that we have set the stage like that, this specific talk, as I told you, will be really focusing on the second part, not so much about the cognitive part. Hopefully, over the course of the week, you will hear a lot of 
people who have been working on different aspects of the cognitive model or the cognitive uh, principles that underpin this architecture. But for this first talk today, I'm really going to discuss about the technical aspect. So this picture was taken at the, uh, the hospital uh, in Paris. And I like it because it just shows all those, you know, like complex, like a lot of bunch of wires everywhere, like cameras, screens, uh, RVs, and, and us roboticists, we love those little displays with 3D stuff and so on. And then when we talk to people like Lorian and, and Marie-Sophie, they, they say, well, we don't care about that. We want robot that works. They say, Why? It's really so, so, so lovely, this, this little screen. It's always funny. So these are our uh, boxes. I told you I would show you boxes. Um, so there's two options now. I can start talking about each and every box. But this, this picture is not made up. It's, it's actually what is running on the robot you saw yesterday. So each of these little colorful boxes correspond to one process on the robot doing something. Um, I created a tool called Boxology to build that. It was a running joke with a colleague, well, this poor old Baxter, like we were talking about, like, stop doing like this spaghetti, you know, like spaghetti dish. They know I love spaghetti. So I created a tool just to build boxes and connect them together. And that makes those beautiful diagrams. The colors here actually represent each of the partners of the project. So like, I don't know, green, for instance, was the University of Trento. Uh, this kind of beige there is the, is the Bar-Ilan University in Israel. So it was also a tool for us to, to know who is doing what. But I thought that was maybe a bit overwhelming to go over all those boxes. So I made a simplified version of, of that with emojis. I love emojis. It's, I'm not even cheating too much here. Like, we have the robot at the beginning and at the end, so the sensors there and the actuators at the end. And then the main function of the architecture are exactly those ones. So you have like the camera drivers that are used to detect the faces and the emotions. They are also used to detect the skeletons of people. We combine them together to build a model of the humans. Uh, over there, we process the audio, we recognize the speech. From that, we do like the dialogue management all that goes to the brain of the robot that decides what to do next and will command some layer of behavior generations, uh, be behavior generation, sorry, and send that to the robot with as well some kind of display functionalities. And, and this part here is about the localization and navigation of the robot in the world. So this is actually the full picture of our architecture. So now that we have this beautiful emoji-based model of our robot, we can actually I, can, I, I will spend the next 10 minutes to go, going over some of those boxes because I think it's still useful to try to go a bit deeper there. So I told you, if we remove the, the robot at, the, at both ends, that's just the, the physical hardware, the physical drivers to the robot. Now, if we look at the, um, at the compass here, what boxes do we have here? Um, so scene perception and understanding, what I was telling you. So it's, it's about uh, localization, trying to be, figure out where we are, and also trying to figure out what is around the robot. And there are, that's a colleague from uh, CVUT who are, who are here uh, in Czech Republic who were working on that. And so you will, we will talk about that later this week as well. Um, maybe some of you are familiar with SLAM here. Um, SLAM is a technique to localize and map the environment using the laser of the robot. One of the things that CVUT developed is a new technique that also using cameras to like take pictures of the environment and trying to figure out, okay, I've seen that before, where I am. And that was really useful in the hospital. You could drop the robot anywhere in the hospital and the, hospital and the robot would immediately local localize itself. And uh, that work was also in, or is also being integrated with something that you might uh, know as well, YOLO ACT, which is a, a state-of-the-art tool to identify objects and trying to map that back to the 3D world. So that's the kind of boxes, <laughs> boxes, uh, functionalities that, that here are feeding the world model of the robot. Okay, now if I, um, if I look now at the top, at the audio processing, so that's the work from, from uh, BIU, the bar Ilan University in Israel. Um, big boxes there. Um, Audio is one of the trickiest bits of, the of our architecture. As you might know, Spring, the focus of Spring was really on dialogue, how to build a robot that can actually chat with you. And you've, been, you've seen the, the, um, the demo yesterday. And when we think dialogue, we often, well, today we really think about chat GPT, LLMs, and things like that, which is the kind of technology we're using as well. But everything that goes before that, 
to turn the pretty well the microphone on ARI are not terrible but they are not amazing uh, uh, either to turn that into something that that provides a solid speech recognition is actually really tricky and uh, the bar Ilan University has been working on a lot of algorithms to like remove noise to separate the different sources if several people are talking together um, uh, try to to improve the the, the 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 sound signal so that you can eventually send it to ASR systems. So in the in in spring we are using the NVIDIA an NVIDIA tool called Riva to do the speech recognition, and uh, and provide that to the rest to the dialogue system the dialogue system that is somewhere here in the architecture. Um, there is also some other bits that are important, and we'll talk about that a bit later today and on Friday as well, is how you associate a voice to the person who is speaking. And if you're very lucky, if there's only one person or the people are quite far apart, then maybe that's easy. Like, okay, I hear the sound coming from there, so it's probably that person speaking. But if you have two people speaking or one person speaking and then she, do she doesn't speak anymore and maybe like five minutes later she, it speak she or he speaks again, you need to be able to identify, so create a signature for that voice and, and re remap the, the voices together. So that's the kind of thing that was done in this part of the architecture. Um, if I look there now, like the tracking, the detection of the people you, you've seen yesterday on the screen, like the, all the bodies being detected. Um, so again, more boxes. Um, the robot was using the fisheye camera to, to try to have like a wide angle and see as many people as possible. Then on top of that, you run uh, a body tracker that will try to identify a 2D body, which is fine but not amazing because often you don't want just to know oh there is like 20 people and that's the shape of their skeletons what you actually want to know is where they are in 3d uh, if their arms are pointing somewhere so this 2d to 3d mapping is not something we've done completely in spring the only thing we do is using the laser scanner we try to detect where the the feet are so that we can at least place in the scene the people and their orientation as well but we don't have the full 3d skeleton it's something that we can do, but it's quite difficult today to run that kind of algorithm with many people in real time on the robot. So we, we only looked at the, mostly at the 2D skeleton plus 3D loca location of the person. Um, looking there now, the face, so there was a lot of things done on the face. Um, more boxes, ha, so many boxes. There's 52 of them I counted. and. How many? 170 connection between all of them. So it's it's a there's a colleague. I'm not going to give the name, but there's a colleague in this room that was complaining yesterday that Ross, the toolkit that we're using to connect all that, was just not able to cope with that. So it would randomly crash without really knowing why. I think we were reaching the limit of the of what this kind of middleware can can handle. Um, but yes, on the faces, so we were detecting the faces, we were also doing like depth estimation based on just the 2D image, trying to rebuild the 3D map of the world to, to be able to localize people. And then things like emotion estimation, gaze estimation. Um, we were detecting if people were wearing uh, facial masks because that work took place during the COVID uh, period. So it was important to know if people were wearing the masks. Um, what we call soft biometrics at the top. Um, Soft biometrics, that's, for instance, the gender, the age, um, those things were also detected. And you can see that you have this kind of connection that lifts up there. And where does it go? Where does it go, that, that wire? It goes to that block here, the, the purple block. And that's what we call our person manager that takes all this information about the bodies, about the voices that has been heard, the faces, and try to merge them together. So I'm not going to say anything about that. It's a surprise for Friday. Um, for one of the hands-on session is about trying to get to work, to get that uh, human person manager to work on using your webcams to see if we can actually build a full complete model model of the of the human. And then the last bit. Um, so this part, it's actually quite interesting to see that the dialogue part there um, and uh, what I've called the brand, the supervision of the robot are really tightly connected and that's something you will find quite often when you develop systems we still haven't really figured out how to properly decouple dialogue management from decision making because dialogue management really needs to feed and get back message from the from the the supervision it's it seems that the length the capability of speaking the language capability is tightly connected to our 
our decision making process. And by saying that, I'm jumping maybe without too many, without being too careful with the cognitive models and cognitive principles I was mentioning at the, be uh, at the beginning. So hopefully, yeah, ho hopefully we will have the colleagues from from uh, Ariot Watt in Scotland who have been working on that that will tell tell us more about that part in uh, today or tomorrow. Um, so yes, those boxes are about uh, using LLMs to do the dialogue management and the inter what we call the interaction manager that using Petri nets to decide what action eventually should be done on the robot. And the last bit, um, action generation. So we have this kind of uh, long list of what we call action servers to, to move, to, to navigate, to look at people, to point at things that will then generate actual comments for the robot. And the last bit there uh, on the, the display, which is something that sounds kind of less central to the architecture, but in practice is really important. That was more about providing the tools for the experimenters to control the robot, to know what was going on, to have this kind of transparency, observability of the system. Uh, there, there's quite a few speakers today that will be talking about the ethics or the Ethical, ethical, responsible approaches to robotic deployment or their development and empowering the users with the tools required to understand what's going on is actually quite central. So that was the last part of the architecture. So that's it. Uh, that was our beautiful architecture. Um, and the glue, you might ask me, how do we connect things together? And maybe I will just finish on that. If there is one tech home message, um, can, is, does someone has a phone and can take a picture of that slide? Because I promised my boss that I would send them back a picture of that slide. So that would be lovely if you could do that. They will pay me at the end of the month, which would be great. <laughs> Amazing. Um, so one of the things we developed during the during the project is what we call ROS for a try. So who, who knows ROS in the in the room, or rather, who does not know ROS? That's fine. There's no shame about that. It's okay. So ROS is a, is a kind of a software um, a framework toolkit to, that is widely used in robotics to connect things together. So all those little wires that you saw between the boxes, they are actually what we call ROS topics or connections between ROS connections between, between capabilities. And one of the things we've developed in the project is this uh, extension of ROS to, to, to cater for the needs of human-robot interaction with like a new model of, of, the, of humans, how we represent humans in the system. And we even wrote a standard that is now part of the official ROS um, pool of, of recommendations. If you go to the wiki.ros.org slash HRI, there is a lot of, like a lot, not a lot, a few um, modules, that, like open source modules you can download, try on your computer or on your robot. It's all open source. So that's, that's, uh, that's useful. And, um, and that's it. Like on, on Friday, we will be playing with this model of the human. So we will, we will try to build our own little a uh, toy like that. I just need to show you one video of how it looks like in the at the end, and then I'll be I'll be done. Maybe we'll see. It was working a minute ago. It's always the same story, right? It was working. <laughs> I don't know. It doesn't really matter. But uh, if I press play, you mean? Yeah. So bas basically, uh, the idea. Well, beyond my lovely colleague Karina that loves to dance, and um, it was really about like. Uh, showing that we can track and combine together information about the faces, the bodies, uh, in, in this kind of top-down view that gives us a, a radar, you know, like radar-style uh, overview of the, the, what the people are doing around the, around the robot. So that's the kind of thing that if you download the, the tools that are on this uh, wiki.ros.org slash hri that you can run on your computer. All right, now time for Mark. Um, Mark, I've known, we've known each other for a long time. Uh, we've never actually really worked together, but we've been kind of following each other for a long time. Uh, so Mark is professor. Uh, I don't know what is exactly the title. Like you're doing a lot of agricultural robotics now, um, but you've been doing a lot of autonomous robots. Uh, you're the head of the of the lab as well of the of the department, and uh, it's my great pleasure to let him talk about more the, to the science of all the little boxes that I've been presenting you uh, around. Excellent, the stage is yours. Thank you, Severin. Um, I think we were formally in the same project for a while in Cognivon. Uh, it was before my time. 
Was it? Yeah, yeah. Oh dear. You were you were hanging around somewhere. I don't know. Excellent. Um, yeah, pleasure to be here. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm going to see if this works. No, of course it. Oh no, it does. Let's see. Oh, cool. No, it doesn't. Excellent. <laughs> right. Technical problems to begin with. There we are. Good. Cool. Um, yeah, welcome everybody. So my name is Mark Haneider. Uh, got, got a couple of roles in this University of Lincoln that hardly anyone knows. Uh, University of Lincoln is uh, about 200 kilometers north of London. Very nice, close to the East Coast. Fantastic beaches there. Cold water, though, I have to say. Um, but otherwise, a nice place to be. Um, a few things, probably I'm going to try to make some links of what Severin has been talking to you about. I have a limited amount of boxes, but I could probably capture a lot of the stuff in boxes as well. Um, I like the design element of that. Um, right, so, uh, yeah, so I've been at the University of Lincoln since 2012, before I was at the University of Birmingham, and before that I was in Bielefeld in Germany. So that's where I'm originally from, if you try to place the accent. Um, so I, uh, I'm leading this group of quite a lot of people that are interested in robotics in the wider sense. That's a big bunch of people there. And I'm trying to find the face that uh, so I was making reference to before. It's in, yeah, in, in the diagram, it's, it's probably easier. That, that's Paul Baxter. So he is in, in our group as well. And so uh, there's another sort of, you know, academia in robotics is all very, very closely knit. So, um, and he must be somewhere on that photo at the bottom as well, which I can't find because the resolution is so crap. Anyway, um, yeah, so please do reach out to me. I'm here all week and I'm probably going to do a little bit of a whistle stop tour of a lot of stuff we're doing. Um, I usually say I'm interested in the term long term autonomy. So I'm really curious about robots that actually operate out in the field, in the wild, which is why I also put this in the title. And I do this in a number of different projects. Um, and I've been already told off by Severin that I'm re recooking the same dish today um, because I'm going to go back quite a couple of years in, uh, with some projects at least. And I'm only spending very little time on the, the latest stuff we've been doing. Uh, and that's because I think for the overall story and linking it to social robotics, that's probably one of the best frames. But we can we can talk a bit more about recent stuff also during the days here. Um, I always keep that slide in there because that's something I mocked up like whatever, 10 years ago now as a sort of motivation slide when I, when I applied for my jobs. And that's what I would love to do, right? So we have robots that eventually uh, you can buy off uh, your favorite e-commerce platform. And um, it's relatively affordable. And what that means, I'm while we had this idea of developmental robotics, cognitive robotics, um, I don't want to spend an awful lot of time when I, my robot comes out of the box in, well, teaching it. I've got two children. I have raised two children. So I don't want to do the same with my robots, right? I want them to actually do something meaningful from day one, right? So uh, I'm often talking then about robots that actually have a lot of innate behaviors, a lot of uh, common sense knowledge, and that's something that, that kind of kept, got me, or kept me excited. But they need to be running for an extended period of time, and they need to get better on the job. So that kind of term, get better on the job, is something I, I like to keep going. Uh, and that is somewhat captured in this also relatively old data uh, diagram, boxes and arrows. Um, so, you know, once we have got some sort of intelligent autonomous behavior and it's robust enough to use it for an extended period of time, long run times in like actual environments, and that could be, uh, you're going to see a little bit about museums, you're going to see a little bit about care homes, you're going to see a little bit about agriculture. Um, once they achieve that, then hopefully they can learn a bit more about that specific environment. I don't know if you know the good old knowledge-based systems, T-Box and A-Box. You may have heard that, right? We have got a bit of fixed rules, and then we have a lot of instance knowledge about the problems that we're currently in. So we're trying to actually learn more about the environment to get better. Um, and in the end, that hopefully allows us to get better on the job, improve performance, and that makes it more robust, and we go around forever. And that's going to hopefully see me through to the end of my career. That diagram I, I plan to still use when I'm 70. <coughs> right? So, but what I found also along the way, and is that 
when you're going into these environments where we've got humans, they are somewhat inherently social, these robots, right? They need to interact for their own good, but also to achieve their tasks. So I'm not necessarily super excited about social robots per se, but I'm really interested in exploiting humans to make robots better and at the same time to serve humans in there. And that basically has an inherent social dimension to that. Right, so far for um, the just intro of what I'm excited about and what I would love to talk to you about more. Um, right, so first thing is first, robust. Right, robust mobile robotic systems for long-term deployment is a bit of a response to what Severa has been talking about, and he hasn't talked as much as I thought about the whole sort of development process. He stuck to the boxes, but you need structure, right? You need people to actually know which boxes they need to fill with life, and you hopefully, I don't know, I don't even know who's fully in charge of the system integration uh, in Spring. I guess it may be you. Um, you need to rely on people doing their stuff well enough. And so I'm going to put a few words on introducing briefly this sort of uh, project that we've been working on strands and then talk a little bit about the whole software engineering principles of that um, and what, we, what we've been looking at. And I do this basically from having gone through the pain of doing this sort of system integrations in EU projects for many years in a variety of different projects uh, where I have been put in charge of that particular uh, boxology part, let's call that, right? Um, so let's let's look um, at this project that actually ended what now six years ago, so quite a while ago, um, and that was really at the core. Uh, the idea was that we achieved this long-term autonomy, and it required robust software. And while we also used the sort of same framework, we used ROS at the time to put our boxes together. Um, we had to actually put quite some effort into making sure that all these different people that work together actually provide these boxes with the right functionality and the robust enough so that we can achieve, as you will see, like years of runtime. So um, this was a project about six different robots, all the same, uh, not PAL robots at that time. This is a Metrolabs platform, uh, G5 platform, I believe, um, which we still use quite a while. We have got Tiagos in our labs as well, which we now use also in uh, the RoboCup at home competition. So that's quite closely related to that. So I've got a team that is competing in that competition as well, um, which actually I just already encouraged the spring guys because I think they could, you know, you could do very well in that domain because there's a lot of challenges that you face yourself. And well, in that one, um, well, let me show you a little bit what the sort of main two main uh, scenarios were. So these are these little robots roaming about. Uh, that one up there is uh, Bet Betty. Uh, so this was from the University of Birmingham, and this is in a in an office environment where these robots roamed around, did some environmental measurements, temperature, humidity, etc. To to that's something that the users of that building basically requested because they had some problems with the air conditioner and wanted evidence. So it roams around and explores the environment and also checks that, you know, people don't leave stuff around lying on their desks because in some parts they had a clear desk policy. So a bit of surveillance uh, system in that sense. And the other one is down here. That was Henry in Haus der Barmherzigkeit in Vienna, uh, which is a care home. And we had the robot doing a couple of things in there. And I'm going to talk a bit more about that part in a second. And the key thing for us was both these are remote destinations. So, uh, you know, I work up there uh, and Haus der Barmherzigkeit is down there. And we run this whole deployment of this robot for three years in total, four years actually, even, um, with no developers, no engineers on site. And that requires quite a bit of... Uh, confidence into your system as a whole. Uh, it had like some cool remote management systems. Uh, in particular, had a, um, a connection to my phone. So we used Slack a lot at the days. Um, and it would constantly be buzzing because something went wrong. I'm going to talk a little bit about what went wrong later on, right? I'm going to not tell you everything now. Um, but we achieved quite long run times through that. And that's what I'm excited about because that allows us to, to do some learning in the wild, right, when you're out there.
Cool. So uh, we don't need to look at the exact numbers, etc. It's been a long time, and it basically blended in with the operations there. Um, in this care home, what we've been doing, um, the robot did a number of tasks and totally did three different jobs. One was what we call the bellbot. So you know, it was lingering at the reception, and people could ask it to be taken to a certain place because this care home is quite big and it also has a sort of therapy wing. So there's some in inpatients. So basically, they come in for the day, um, and they can be guided to uh, their whatever therapy room, etc. Uh, and there's quite a few visitors. So that was there was a whole workshop with the uh, with the people who work in this care home, and that's, that's the outcome of that was the sort of main task that they want to do. Um, I'm still to find out what the spring robots are actually doing in the hospital, so because uh, I missed the session yesterday, but I'm curious to hear about what sort of tasks you came up with. Uh, the other one was um, the so-called walking group, which is uh, a care home specializing in people with quite severe cognitive um, um, impairments. So uh, they'd have one sort of occupational therapy session that is about uh, basically going what they call the Nordic walking group. So they just walk around the building, but they engage in sort of, uh, you know, singing, social interaction, etc. And what the therapist wanted us to do is that we have the robot as a sort of pace setter, um, as a focal point, really. So it's a really new idea of how you can use robots because they what this, the problem with the biggest problem they have with this, they have a bunch of like whatever 10 to 20 patients coming with them. And the biggest problem is that they will forget what activity they're currently engaged in and they will start wandering off doing their own thing. So, in a way, the therapists are shepherds, right? They're trying to get the keep the flock together to some extent. And they come up with, yeah, oh, can't we use this robot to basically join in the tour, take the lead? Because it's a new stimulus that people have, are not familiar with, it will focus them. And so they actually thought they can take this robot around in there. Uh, and so we did a lot of special development just for them. You see these sort of lanyards. There's a little kind of target on them, which enables the admin interface. So they could use this car to get make the robot do certain things and be in control, actually be absolutely in control. And so a part of that was designing these sort of behaviors with them, and then the robot would be going around. We were very excited because we forced them to use this robot for a while, as you do in projects, right? Because we wanted to get our research done. And then uh, after we've done our data gathering and it kind of worked, uh, we said, like, oh, if you want, you can keep using it, right? You just go up to the robots, select the task, and then you can use your little lanyard and do it. And they kept using it, at least one group did. I'll come back to that story in a second. Which is cool, right? So actually, it, it kind of felt useful. And then, of course, the project was over, the funding ran out, the robot went back home, and it's no longer there. Cool. Um, the last one is Info Terminal. I'm going to talk about that a bit later as well. Um, building such a system is not as easy as it seems, even if you build like, nicely on top of the sort of ROS stuff. Uh, we had nasty accidents that uh, triggered quite some health and safety concerns as well. So this is actually the robot has an having fallen down the stairs in that care home. Why did that happen? Well, in that case, it happened because we had a nice cliff detection, but somebody in the team had decided they want to disable it because it gave some false positives too often, and they didn't see why it would be useful anyway because they didn't see where there were any sort of drops, so they decided to turn it off. That's the result, right? And this is the problem with, with lots of these complex systems, uh, you know, you have got, as we've seen in the boxology, there's lots of different colors, and I'm pretty sure you, n the main integrator is not always aware of what happens in each of those colored boxes, and when there is a new version or new release of that one. So we need to somehow try to actually test these systems slightly better. Um, and then we've got the sort of uh, general problem, I'll put this here as a sort of typical challenges in software development, uh, when you're in academia, there's lots of pressures on you, right? Lots of PhD students wanting to get their papers out, uh, lots of supervisors not really caring too much about uh, that particular uh, overall system. They may have a number of students, and so they are more focused on getting publications out, rightly so, I would say. That's probably one of their main drain, um, uh, you know, focuses. Uh, most of these developers are relatively junior, probably have just started their PhD or postdoc, 
They may not be familiar with that particular software they're using. So that's often a problem. We hack for a paper. If you get the paper out, we move on to the next thing. So that's a sort of typical thing in academia. So it's probably different in industry now. Mm, probably, right? But we need robustness. We need reproducibility. And actually, I would argue for science, reproducibility is really, really important. And you see there's more and more focus on that, that you can actually evidence and reproduce also from a software point of view what you do in the paper. So I think it gives you at least credibility if you can show that you can easily reproduce that. Um, so I'm going to rush through this relatively quickly. So we put a lot of, let's call it semi-professional software engineering tool chains in place um, from that. And that has carried through and is now kind of modernized. It's not using this relatively outdated software. But the principle is still there. And for an academic institution, that's a bit rare, I would say, these days. But it's really important for us to achieve some of the robustness uh, of the systems that when we deploy them for long periods of time. Right, so we um, um, pretty much adopting some sort of standard uh, industry standards for the software development, which means there is some unit tests, there is some so-called continuous integration pipelines. So when people make change to the code, it at least undergoes some tests, there is some code review. Um, and the only thing I do as a sort of lead for the center is, well, you need to put everything in here. There's a few prescribed tests that you need to actually implement in your code before we put it into our system. Um, and we designate a few people who are in charge of that box, of that box, of that box, effectively. Um, and for those who are not that familiar with that, I'm going to do a very quick run through. So people may be doing a sort of working on a new feature. Uh, they modify their code. They make some commits to that, their specific feature, branch, fork, whatever you want to call that. Uh, they open so-called pull requests um, or merge requests or whatever. It depends on the the systems you're using, and that triggers at least some sort of basic testing in our system. And we're not only doing the good old classic unit tests, there are some system tests that are automatically being triggered. So the, 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 the new box that you implement is being tested in the context of, the, of all the boxes, effectively. Um, standard by standard, that's usually just in simulation, right? Because doing this in reality is particularly resource intensive, but some of that uh, is also done automatically done in on hardware. So what does that look like? Say so it's going to be just a very quick whistle stop tour. So this was the, the good old way. And I can probably show you also this from a, I can show it working live on our GitHub uh, organization if you want. But everything that has been changed, you saw the little green tick there. That means the test run through and succeeded. You can actually look at the artifacts of those tests. Uh, this is done on a Morse simulator. Again, Severin had quite a big role in that simulator. Don't think, is it still alive? Yes, 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 yes. Because so, quite a. So it is. It, yeah. <laughs> so we, it's actually the tests are still running on that old version of that. So you can look at that. You can see if all these tests run through. And so that gives the, the manager of that box the chance to actually. Uh, you know, not only look at the code, but have some confidence that it's not going to break the whole thing. So that was a few defined navigation test cases. So we're talking in this case only about the navigation subsystem, which was somewhere uh, down here in the severance diagram, right? So sort of this, what run in this system test that was automatically triggered was some mapping, some localization, and some path planning. And so whenever people were changing that part, we had some sort of confidence that it was there. And even we had a little hardware test arena and we put this together also with the same sort of pipeline um, it just needed somebody to approve it so there was a queue where you say like right okay here's a navigation test that needs to be scheduled so somebody actually had to oversee it which means it's really quite expensive so you only do this really like maybe as a last step before you merge that code you want to actually accept that test to run on the real robot as well cool Interestingly, so there's sort of, I'm going to focus on the navigation uh, use case as a sort of typical example. And this probably doesn't look that much different to what people are doing in spring, even till today. So actually, this sort of overall navigation sub-architecture is somewhat still alive today. We use that, uh, a lot of that, actually, in agriculture, in agri-robotics these days. It actually is underpinning uh, the main sort of uh, navigation system of a company now, 
that started and now has basically tr sent robots around fields, strawberry fields all across the world and vineyards. And they have accrued about, well, they, they went around the earth to so celebrate that they went around the earth in terms of accrued kilometers that were traveled based on that stuff that we bu built in that days. For a care home, it's now gone out into the fields. So I think that's quite an often an important shift that we see that we can translate technology across different uh, domains. So we've got a kind of classic mapping, let's call this continuous planning system at the bottom. We put some topological things on top because they carry some meaning. We can reason about that. So it's a nice abstraction of the environment. We put some notes somewhere. We know these notes um, can carry some meaning and they give us some predefined um, paths that we can go through. Um, and then we can have different actions underneath, which may actually mean that we have a different action to go from here to here, then we go from here to here, because there may be special environments. So we use this topological mapping uh, a lot in many of our applications. And on top of that, we put quite a bit of monitoring because what we always need is some sort of recovery because things will always go wrong, right? And so we put a lot of effort into dealing with things going wrong. Because when you do things in the wild long term, things do go wrong. And we had lots of different recovery behaviors implemented over the years. Here are some of them. And one of them is request help from a human, probably the most important one, as we will see in a bit. And then we put on top of that um, you know, some learning from navigation, some task execution. Uh, for planning, it's quite nice to have this topological level of abstraction because all of a sudden you have a discrete state space that is relatively manageable in size. So um, most of the system is in this kind of hierarchical way. Top level, reasons about the topology. Further down, we execute just to go from one place to another. Now, talking about failures, what were sort of failures in there? Very often, the robot would just not go along this edge. Maybe because something had changed in the environment. Maybe it was uncertain about its localization system that, you know, something had been going wrong there and it was too uncertain and was not confident of moving anymore. Uh, it may have crashed into something that it didn't see. I had some kind of safety bumpers around this. So lots of things can possibly go wrong. And an interesting thing about when things go wrong, and I'm going to do a little bit of an, of an excursion here onto trust because um, we had a sort of paper with a lot of colleagues that know much more about trust in HRI than I do, uh, where we try to find the, make, make a link between failures, potential mitigation strategies, and what impact it has on people's trust in that system. And I, we go with the definition by uh, Bertrand Malle about two kinds of trust when we talk to, about autonomous systems here. There's on the one hand capacity trust, that's all about is it competent doing that job? Does it have the capacity to accomplish a job? Right? Important definition. And the other one is moral trust. Does it do the right thing? Does it choose the right tasks to accomplish? So in a way, we can do it simple as, can it do the tasks competently and reliably? Does it do the right tasks? And quite often, when we talk about moral trust, that's often on us as the designers, right? We have so far not really gone, gone down the route of many systems deciding their own tasks necessarily completely. Um, and we may not even want autonomous systems to take that route, right? So it's an interesting uh, definition. I was at a philosopher's conference once and we had a big row about the definition of autonomy. Because, uh, you know, we have an Severin, it comes from the autonomous region of Catalonia. <laughs> and that means autonomous as being self-governed, making your own decision. You decide whether you're going to do this or not to do that. We probably in robotics often don't want that, right? We, we want to tell those machines, do this, but to do it well with good capacity. So the philosophers disagree with the term of autonomous system. And it kind of made me almost wonder whether I need to change uh, the center's name, right? Because we are the center for autonomous systems. Um, and probably we, 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 it's, it's a minefield talking about actual autonomy in the, in the original meaning of the word. Now, I'm talking only about capacity trust. Does it do the job it's supposed to do competently? Um, and what we see here, that you've seen this sort of 
tour um, this walking group in this muse uh, in this not, not museum in this care home and what we've seen there is there was two groups there was a therapist uh, a group of therapists that always did it, did this on Mondays and there was another group different bunch of people that run sessions on Thursdays and after each session we ask them to give us uh, uh, you know a, a, an assessment of how well it worked with actually emojis like you know big smiley okay kind of a, so um, and what came out of that the, the 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 Monday group you see sort of the trend let's call it over time having more confidence and being happier with the system they got accustomed with it and it kind of worked and the the Thursday group had a massive system failure in one session right and they still kind of gave it decent so that's where the exclamation mark there that session failed it was aborted because the robot actually had a malfunction so Whitley they still gave it come on somewhat average scores at the end of that session and the, after that the robot worked perfectly but their assessment went down you, it's really hard to recover from failure when it comes to the trust that pe the users have in that system. If it had failed once, you take a long time to regain trust to work again. So how can we potentially deal with that? And so when, then we thought about what sort of mitigations can we do for failure? And of course, one thing is empowering people and make them understand the failure and uh, probably even see if they could help us. So sometimes that's quite easy. Here's a, this is Bet Betty again in this other office area. Uh, Betty doesn't have an arm. Betty is very much stuck with doors, so she needs people to hold the door for them, for it, right? And people do that. They are willing to help. They perfectly understand that. The appearance of the robot very clearly communicates, I can't open doors. And so if it says, can you hold the door for me? People do, right? Very friendly. And they actually do this repeatedly because they have an inherent understanding this is a failure or an ability that this robot doesn't have. So I'm happy with that to help it out with that problem. So they are willing to help. And it's fine to have limited capacity because it's understood by people, I would argue. Now, the other thing that can happen, and this is a map from the care home, and it point, it shows all the failures that have happened over the time. So whenever there was a sort of navigation failure or any sort of system failure, we put a little dot so we knew where they were happening. And they were somewhat clustered in some parts here, right? And this is where the reception desk is. This is where uh, a person works there eight hours a day, and he was the grumpy receptionist. And I put this cup there, right? Because it says, my level of sarcasm depends on your level of stupidity. And he just get, got furious, because what does this robot do? It will first try to recover when something went wrong. And then it would say, Oh, sorry, I'm stuck. Can you help me out, please? And if you are the receptionist working there eight hours a day and this bloody robot comes along and every 20 minutes says, Oh, can you help me out, please? You're getting furious. And you're particularly getting furious because it's an unacceptable incompetence, right? This whole job of this thing is to move about. So he didn't like that at all. We actually had to really put a lot of effort into a particular... We really focused on this area to make the navigation as possibly robust as you know you can possibly get in that place just because we lost this person and this was an important stakeholder i can tell you right so um what is important in that case so what he didn't particularly like is that he was repeatedly doing that so we took that as motivation and said oh you know what let's put another box in our architecture uh and think about if we can avoid me we can't probably avoid making mistakes or you know failing at some place but let's work towards failing less in the same situations uh, and that motivated a paper that uh, got into uh, RAL um, and that was about don't make the same mistake again learning from demonstrations in the wild because what the recovery behavior was you know Robert would ask can you help me out here we disengaged the motors and people were encouraged to just move it a little bit, wriggle it out of the situation, and then it would recognize that it was stopped and they would try again to do its task. That usually was enough. But you see from these bars that it's very difficult to get help, right? Help is rare 
It's a very valuable resource, so you really want to make the best of it. If somebody shows, if, is willing to help you, don't just say, oh, I'm helped now. Let's actually use that. Let's use that sort of demonstration potentially as a way to, that's not me, right, okay. Um, without going to too much technical detail, what we did was basically <coughs> modeling this demonstration as a Gaussian process. So taking the sensor inputs, the LIDAR scan, et cetera, as a sort of environment model of the current situation, and linking it directly to the demonstrated action. So when you push a robot, those who know robots, you can measure the, how the wheels are moving, you can move the odometer, and basically you can see this as an actually learning from demonstration problem, right? We've got a state space, we've got an action that is being demonstrated, and then when we encounter a situation that is similar, we replay this as long as the current situation matches our learned models well enough, right? And that allows us to actually reduce that a lot Right, to go uh, into these systems and recover for specific situations. I mean, this is the sort of um, mean numbers of in, um, interventions of like, how many do we get? So we got about 20, so monitored navigation events. We got 22 failures per kilometer distance traveled originally. That's, the, that's one me measure. The important thing was it was always in the same spots. Right? We always had this in, the, in a few challenging situations where it was very narrow or something like this. And that was the way to overcome that. Okay, cool. So that's one way of actually using interacting to do some simple demonstration. It was, you know, few shot learning. So you can do, you can estimate a Gaussian process relatively quickly from a few demonstrations. So after like three, four play times of failing in that spot, it would not fail anymore because it would invoke its specific learned recovery behavior. Cool. So, um, talking more about getting better on the job. Um, one thing that we then did was this using this robot out there. I mean, said it's been out there for a, a year in total. And um, one of the jobs that it had was the so called info terminal. Now, that's just an iPad on wheels, if you want it, right? It's a very stupid system that just offers a number of services to people that are uh, in this care home. Uh, they could look up the menu, they can look up the weather, the news, some entertainment features. Something you could also just do in a device like this. Only difference is it is actually roaming around and it's offering its services. And you, we wanted to just ask, uh, see, in this whole space that we're in, where do we want to be when? Where am I most useful? Okay? So, quite simply put, uh, this is the map of the entire kind of ground floor of that facility. Uh, and with the people on site, we designated a couple of spots that they deemed generally would be all right for the robots to be around. And so they'd selected this to be near like the chairs where people sit or waiting areas or lifts or whatever. So we put them in various of these discrete places. Um, and of course, we can go around and this robot roams, goes to these places. So we know its location, we know what, what the time is, and we want to see whether people will use it. So our measure of success is just do people use it when it is there. So we had time windows of 10 minutes, I believe. So we wouldn't went somewhere, waited for somebody to interact with it for 10 minutes, and then just wandered off if there wasn't anyone there. Um, and what we came about in as an observation from that, uh, that there was in, in how people act, how humans act in general, I'm going to generalize this a little bit, is our life is determined by a lot of periodicities. We have lots of routines that we do, right? So during the day, we have got different set of meals when we like to um, eat. Uh, we have got other sort of patterns in our lives, weekly patterns, and, and there may even be higher frequency patterns. And that led to uh, an idea that uh, we call frequency map enhancement that has been exploited in many, many different ways now, where the whole idea is we can model the change of a state space, more generally, as a superposition of several um, periodic functions. Yeah? For those who have a bit of ma uh, mathematical background, it's basically a Fourier transform. So we transform the state changes into a spectrum of state changes. OK? Um, what is quite nice about that, and this is why I am call it Fremen, and it's not Fremen uh, 
from the Dune. But in a way, it's similar because it's very good with resources. It's very resource efficient because you don't need that much data to estimate periodic function, right? Sampling theory tells us you need to have <coughs> um, uh, double the bandwidth as sampling, basically. And then you can recover absolutely correctly the underlying periodic processes. So you don't, you can, when you are there, you can sample relatively sparsely to discover sort of particular long-term periodic processes. So, um, and that could be almost anything, right? The general idea is we can sort of estimate this and we only keep the most prominent, the most dominant spectral components. It's a question of how many of those you want to actually retain. So, um, with that, we've done this in, in many, many different ways of what we wanted to model. So this is modeling uh, an, a grid map, 3D grid map, um, uh, where we modeled actually which cells in this map were empty and not empty. So this was from a robot constantly mapping the environment over time of our office spaces. And you get an idea of when people appear and when people disappear. And there's also, you, you, you know, you can see that some of them actually, that guy up there is static because he's just always in the office. The others were nicely daily periodicity. That guy up there, top right, and it's true, I know this for a fact, he's just almost always in the office. <coughs> so he, he blended in with the background in the end. Um, you can also do this to uh, model actual um, predicates, right? The, the truth value of predicates, are they true or not in a certain setting? Because we've seen this sort of object model that you use in Spring as well. So that was another sort of thing that we did. And even skeleton things, what, what sort of actions do people do in certain times of the day? You know, making coffee is something you see. You know, so, so we did this and we really ran with it for a, quite a long period of time to see whether we can extract periodicities. Um, and so ours, in this, in this work, the whole point was predict the next, predict the utility of a location and you need to have a sort of nice balance between exploration and exploitation, right? Simple trade-off here is 50-50 that we did in this work. There's some other work where we've done this, uh, exploit this for, for more planning horizons. The cool thing is it kind of works. Um, so what we've seen is where this is kind of gives you a color coding of which were most successful. Interestingly, the lifts were the most successful ones because people opportunistically just see robot there. So let's actually uh, interact with it in this place. And the thing that I'm mostly excited about is this graph goes up, right? There's a, you do a linear fit and there's a, 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 a significant trend going upwards. If the success, while it's all overall very noisy for each day that we've done this, the overall fit is a trend as it goes up. So we've actually learned to be in the right place at the right time from actually learning from these periodicities where the robot is useful. That's what we can take away from them. Cool. So that was a robot that got better on the job. The job was relatively simple. Taking this a bit further, something a bit more modern and what we've just recently completed, that was a long-term project of a robot in a museum. Um, again, I think there's quite some, uh, if you look at the challenges, maybe we can talk a bit more about what Spring has encountered in terms of challenges. If you want multi-party interaction, that is an interesting challenge. Um, and we've done this for five years where it was in the um, Archaeological Museum in Lincoln. And its job was to give tours to people. And we started off with a very prescribed way of doing that. So we had a simple touch interface, same platform actually, um, different color. Uh, and the educational team in that museum designed us some tours. It was the one that is most popular is death and burial, for whatever reason. People like that sort of black uh, touch to it. And then this robot would go around, talk a little bit about the exhibits there, use a bit of um, shared attention as well, so it kind of can direct the eyes to look at the artifact, to make reference to it. So a few kind of basic interaction, also non-verbal interaction in there. Um, we played around with speech recognition. Uh, it's not working reliably enough in that sort of type of space, um, particularly with multi-party. So cool work to carry on with this sort of domains. But so the whole interaction was eventually touch-based and non-verbal. 
well, the it, the only it was only talking about the exhibits, which also leads to a bit of an imbalance because if something talks, people expect they can talk back. So there's a lot of talk into the void by people that are out there. Um, yeah, cool, right? Again, similar topology, predefined nodes, some predefined routes. Uh, we did a bit of the stuff that you've seen before in there as well. So learning uh, to overcome the common mistakes, making the whole navigation system more robust, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, this one was really long, right? Three and 3.3 years overall. Uh, of that, it was operational uh, a total of 1.2 years, where it ran around, uh, traveled quite some distance. Time when it was when the museum was open and it was actually interacting was about 75 percent. So we had about 15,000 interactions, and we've run a similar system as what Severin was telling before to get an estimate of the demographics, uh, an estimate of their uh, sex, an estimate, you know, so you get some of this sort of what the museum is particularly excited about, get a bit of a feel who is actually using this. And we also used it to provide context in what I'm going to talk about next to actually provide more customized tours. If you know you've got a group of children that may be different to a group of adults. None of this had been taken into account by the museum people initially. Okay, so similar theme, right? We deploy this robot can do the job on day one because we put a lot of engineering into it. It's robust enough to leave on its own. Uh, again, this was of course every day schedule. It would undock, do its job, dock again at some point. <clears throat> now, what we wanted to do here, rather than doing our periodicities, we wanted to actually see whether we can do reinforcement learning in the wild. And reinforcement learning in, in that sense is, I hope that most people are somewhat familiar. For those who are not familiar with reinforcement learning, very quick, you have a so-called policy which maps a current state to a set of action. So you've got an action space, you choose from a set of actions that you can do in this particular situation. And you're trying to learn the best policy. It gives you something like the, the best reward. So what you always need for reinforcement learning, for everything you do, you get basically a reward. Is it good or not so good what you do? So an important thing is to have a measure of reward, how well you're doing. You know, it's a, it's a, a machine learning technique which doesn't really tell you what you need to do. It just tells you, what you have, how good is what you have done. Yeah? Um, and that's in general good to get better on the job. But doing that in sort of in the wild, just of a deployed robot on its own, um, is particularly hard. And we did not want to have like questionnaires or something, a very structured way, where people just you know take a tour and at the end we present them with a questionnaire, mark how well this worked, etc. We wanted to do it right there from just uh, being immersed in the experience. So the first thing was. Um, yeah, well, the, the question was, can we learn better tours through long-term interaction with the public? And the key thing is to make it somewhat manageable. We had to kind of boil it down quite a bit. So the only set of actions that this robot could choose from was the order of tours. So where did it go? How long the tour is? And what level of detail, what sort of text it conveyed? Uh, did it give a very uh, superficial explanation about this particular thing? Or did it go into depth about an exhibit? So well, that was the so-called action space. Um, <coughs> and, the, and the sort of state space describing what they did is was the current length of the tour, where it was, where it is at the moment, and the composition of the group, of the people that were around it. Right? So with that in place, we could do a lot of, course, of policy learning based on our pre-described model of what the, what the um, uh, what the uh, educational team has given it, and then we can engage in sort of online learning in that. First thing we need is a good model of reward. Well, we need some reward, let's call it. And here I'm going to talk about engagement. So we wanted to see whether people were still engaged and were with us and wanted to actually uh, kind of probably carry on the tour. Are they still with us or have they done something completely different? Have they dozed off? Are they wandering around? Are they looking at their phones? And um, we could have gone the way there's lots of really elaborate cognitive models of engagement. Many of them are around gaze, so identifying gaze. But again, I make a reference to Samara because one of the cool tools he did was a gaze tool at some point, right? Which is about, and I think it's probably also in ROS4HRI somewhere. 
So it's about trying to establish gaze. Now, for us, that would have been particularly hard from that camera that was on the robot. It was also particularly difficult uh, because people are moving around. The robot moves around, so it's uh, a very difficult way to kind of uh, properly establish the gaze. And then you also need to have the context of where do they need to look at some point. So we did what everybody does these days. We said, like, well, we do this end to end, right? We just take a machine learning model because we don't care exactly how well it works as long as it gives us something to learn from. So we did uh, a paper where we took this sort of data, threw it through some combination of CNN doing the vision from the cameras and uh, doing a little bit of a recurrent module where we take some sort of get together frames together, let's call it in, in an LSTM. And out it comes a, a regression onto a feature space of zero to one, just a scalar of saying not engaged at all, fully engaged on a continuous spectrum of zero to one with the sigmoid function. Nice. Right. Um, very crude in a way. And we trained this by showing the videos from these systems because the assumption was people have a relatively good intuition about whether people look engaged or not. Those who are teaching probably know this yourself, right? You look around the room and you can probably figure out who are engaged and who are not. And so we have an intuition. And we took this sort of idea that people have an intuition to give them a, a, an annotation tool where they could play videos and just had a constant slider. They could just say, oh, very, oh, no, no, oh, here's another video. And they just did this. And then we did some iterator um, assessment, see whether people had some congruence in how they assessed that. And it was 0 0.75, 7, 8, something like that. Um, so relatively decent um, agreement, iterator agreement between our three people that assess these videos. And then we trained that system, right? And that gives us a rough idea. And it actually is uh, one of those things that uh, put out there. And I've just put some, I've, I've started the, the, the transfer to ROS2. So we have a chat about whether that should be part of uh, ros 4 hri possibly. Because it's, we, we've done the same from a data set that was done on a little, uh, what are those called? Not, uh, not Pepper, the other one. Now, thank you, <laughs> right? Uh, it was a now data set where uh, people have published this data set and they have done a lot of annotation and we've got strong correlation from their actually expert annotation of engagement as well. It's a completely different point of view. So it seems to be a quite decent tool. Use that as reward. Do some reinforcement learning on it. Uh, here's a sort of scanner of printing that. Very noisy, very noisy signal, right? Continuous noisy signal. But that's okay, right? We have, that's what reinforcement learning is there to deal with, that you have got some rough assessment of um, the level of engagement, uh, some, some, some sort of reward. Yeah, and um, then we did this, and indeed it kind of started learning those tools. Um, very complicated figure that I'm not going to go through all, uh, it's all in the paper in detail. What we see is that under different states descriptions, so we see there's like shorter path to go through, when people, you know, when of certain demographics, of certain, when we have a sort of assessment of the current state, we often offer shorter tours, um, describe more about some exhibits. Some are more interesting potentially than others. And in the end, what we get is a similar sort of graph that we have seen before, right? I'm very obsessed about showing these job robots getting better on the job. So, done some work where you know, the robot was there, it's been in the museum for a very long period of time, didn't change, always shows the same sort of tours. Engagement went down. We started enabling the sort of learning of that. Engagement went up. We turned it back off. It went back down, effectively. And this is just showing some of the sample points in there for each week, I think. Um, and so the whole story is, yes, you can actually, with some sort of, without actually having direct interaction with the people, you can learn a bit about your... Uh, your audience and try to learn better tools. And, and that gets me excited, right? So you can get this sort of very crude feedback from people out there, completely unsupervised, no uh, humans around. Okay, so, uh, and I think that's where, so this project has come to an end. This is now where I say, like, yeah, 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 I'm coming to an end. <coughs> So I need to do a little bit of agriculture as well, because that's what we do a lot in these days. And 
I wonder what sort of HRI are we doing in agriculture? We do, this is the part of the work where we do a lot with industry. So we've got huge amounts of projects that are funded by Innovate UK. Think of it in the European landscape as innovation actions, right? Not research innovation actions, but innovation actions effectively with, with a strong industrial component. One interesting job uh, that we've been playing around with is uh, supporting fruit pickers. You may know uh, the country that I live in decided a couple of years ago something about leaving the EU, uh, which cut a quite good flow of workers uh, that they were heavily relying on, which have, is still a problem these days. So in the northern figures for 2022, the whole industry lost around 20% of their crop yields because it was not picked, because they couldn't find the labor to actually get the crops in to the point that actually a lot of farms decided not to actually put crops out the year after because they knew they're going to do this and we have a big problem with our food resilience in the country due to that. So uh, what I've learned recently from some people in the sector is that our resilience, so that basically we have, that it's, it's the measure of the days to empty shelves, right? It's a very crude measure of just saying, uh, well, if there's something bad happening, how long will we have got supply of food? It used to be something around 40 to 50 days normally. That's the sort of how resilience in the food supply chain is measured. We're down to about four days, apparently. <coughs> um, so the, the sector is in real turmoil, right? Real trouble. Um, and you think about, well, introducing robotics, you know, there's all these fantastic projects about automating, picking, etc. And you may appreciate that it's, you know, it's cool, it's an academic challenge to pick raspberries, strawberries, whatever. Um, the systems are not out there yet to do that at a competitive rate at all. So we, one of the things we said, we're like, well, let's consider if we can do the stuff that we can do well. We've done a lot of projects, also EU projects in logistics. Let's take some platforms out we can, we can navigate so, uh, and see whether we can just support them for transportation. Because actually, it turns out these people spend, spend around 20% of their time moving stuff about. Um, and so that has some aspects of fleet management overall. We need to then have some cool interfaces. You know, really, input service design becomes important. You're talking to people that the end users don't necessarily speak English. Uh, they have gloves, so the sort of levels of interaction they can do is quite limited. Um, and it all needs to be really cheap and very robust. So one of the things we did is develop this little embedded system here, some, um, uh, uh, some uh, oh, forgot even what the platform is. Uh, you know, some, some sort of embedded system on that. I'll, I'll, I'll look it up. Oh, some ESP32 with some uh, Wi-Fi, with some uh, connectivity in there, and a very cheap GPS on board. Um, and that one allows us to have an idea. We don't measure where the people are. We measure, they push little trolleys. Um, and we want to know where those trolleys are, because then we can estimate how much they will have gathered as they push through this field. We can, we can build models for each of them individually to know how much yield they will probably have over time. They can also push a button to call a robot over to them. So it's a summon a robot button. So if I see that actually my crate gets full, I can say robot come here and retrieve it from me. But the interesting science bit is we want to estimate that, right? We want to learn when they most likely need this and anticipatory scheduling. Have a robot linger nearby so there's as minimal downtime as possible. That's an interesting fleet coordination aspect. And first challenge is also to overcome these very cheap sensors. Uh, we have this very, very constrained topology in these fields. You can't go under these tabletops. So this is what the map looks like. And it, uh, we can use that to constrain. We can use just run standard robotics technology, multi-sensor fusion, use the GPS, and use some other sensors that are on board of the robot where, so it can detect people, so it can see whether there's somebody in this row or not in this row. And you merge that together and have what we call a topological particle filter. Not going to talk too much about that in particular, just the sort of idea of the same that you do with robotics localization. So uh, you have a particle filter, which is a, a Bayesian um, approach to track multiple hypotheses where it could be. You make a lot of observations. So you make observations of this noisy GPS. You make observations from the robot sensors that can detect people, etc. You bring it together. 
and you can relatively well estimate which of these nodes people are in, because that's the only thing we care about, right? How are they fast? Are they moving? And then we have a sort of continuous time um, exponential distribution of leaving a node to go to a neighboring node because we know how fast they're picking. So even if we don't have uh, a lot of observations for some time, because we have a good model of each of those pickers, we can estimate where they are likely going to be, putting all this together, and then we can send a robot there. Now that allows us to get a bit of an idea of you know, uh, where they are with that sort of uh, system. And we've got lots of different platforms that are running around in these uh, strawberry fields. This is one that does UVC light treatment, not comp interacting with humans, better not, because it's actually quite hazardous to humans. So this is a fully autonomous system. That's the system that has been running reliably now all around the Earth, effectively, in terms of a true distance. Um, talking a bit about the sort of interaction challenges, the last thing. Most challenges in agriculture all, all around uh, regulation, safety, actually deploying robots in, in the real autonomous robots in the fields is a major also regulatory and safety challenge in the UK particularly because we've got something that's called public right of way. So there's a lot of, it's not like in the US, if you enter some farmer's field you're being shot. We accept people going <laughs> out into people's fields. So you encounter dock walkers in the middle of the night and you need to deal with that. Terribly difficult also to convince the regulators and the insurance companies that you are allowed to do this. And interestingly, at the moment, we have got uh, so new drops, which are robot shepherds. These are people that just monitor the autonomous operation. Um, and weirdly enough, the only accidents that have happened so far is with those poor souls because they are out in the fields and, uh, you know, it's in the middle of the night potentially. And so then it becomes a real challenge for them to stay attentive. And so there's some potential risk for them as well. So we've done in this so-called MESAPRO project, which was funded by uh, actually Lloyd's Register Foundation. So that's the insurer, right? They are interested to find out what can we do to move towards autonomous robots in this domain. Um, lots of different technologies about perception of humans, skeleton tracking, finding out what sort of gestures people are doing in front of this. Interesting actions you're doing in agriculture, very different than you do in a museum, because of course there's people picking, bending down, crouching, all sorts of strange position. We had, I heard something about fall detection earlier on. Uh, we're more interested in crouch detection, which may look somewhat similar. Um, but getting that to a standard that an insurer will accept. So to quantify the residual risk is a real challenge in that domain. But we play a lot with the technology in this domain to um, uh, make these robots uh, work better in that sense. Uh, sort of different, you know, uh, sort of collision sensors that you can play with. And again, the sort of interaction, because you don't know what the language these people are speaking, a lot of that is nonverbal, beeps, etc., etc. So, you know, if you look at these sort of regulatory frameworks, you need to have something that is nonverbal, people are intuitively responding to. Cool. All right. I'll, I was asked to wrap up, so I'll wrap up now. Um, <coughs> I'm going to. Does this run? Does this run at all? No, it does not run. Oh, it does not run. Doesn't matter. Um, I think my key, key take home messages is on the one hand, embrace change, right? So there is a lot of challenges in long term autonomy, but there is also a lot you can learn for, uh, in these domains to make robots better on the job. Um, these sort of systems are going to fail. So better start thinking from day one, of course, how you make them fail less, but how you're actually handling failure. There is not enough emphasis, I think, in there of how we can handle failure, and in particular also not making the same mistake again. So I'll give you a bit of an idea around that. And sort of these learning some routines can help a great deal, I think, to become more effective and efficient. I'm going to show you a few sort of things that can go wrong, right? I promise that. Um, we've seen that one already, falling down the stairs. This was the robot in the museum falling down into a hole in the floor. You see what they did there? So, you know, construction said they put this barrier up. So they, they called us in panic. Your robot ran into the barrier. It's what's wrong. I don't know. Those who know robotics well enough see this barrier, this flimsy. Actually, you can't really tell. It's very shiny. 
It's very metally, it's very thin, very shiny. Uh, the, the robot has got a, this is the slit of the LiDAR sensor. So it's all probably in there, these lit, these very thin poles, but it's all, it, it done the right thing, right? It went right in the middle of that, so there was space in between. <laughs> um, it also had a cliff detector, or like a camera in, at the front. Unfortunately, these things were not visible to a Kinect. It turns out, we looked at the bags later on, we couldn't find anything in there. Um, and I would argue one of the things that we also have to do when we talk about social robotics is to it, train people about uh, the understanding of how a robot sees the world. So I've been playing around with some sort of even uh, AR systems, right? You know, you put this on and it just superimposes onto the actual world the sensor data of a robot. So you can see what it actually sees and what it can't see. And that would probably help as a sort of educational tool. Um, so yeah, things falling down, people being nasty, like blocking, like this was the errors of uh, like numbers of failure in this care home. Uh, robot would just, everything failed. Just bing, bing, bing on my phone. And what happened? Well, they, ha they staged a Christmas market in there. Though They put stalls everywhere and whatnot. Um, the, this one, I haven't marked it. I think it was this one. Um, was that robot called that, you know, wheels were blocked or couldn't, couldn't move. Looked at the camera. There was the decorators put this decorator sheet, this very thin plastic thing all across the floor because they were doing some painting job without telling us. Got wrapped around the wheels, didn't work anymore. Uh, you know, people putting planters, sofas in, in the middle of the places uh, in, on top of the charging station. And we get all these sort of error messages constantly when things were going wrong. So that's really uh, some cool things that, go, that can happen. Robot couldn't charge. That's from the museum robot again. What happened? The chewing gum. It mopped up the chewing gum from the floor that was on, stuck onto the charging connectors. Well, there's things you cannot learn, right? <laughs> it's good that we can detect them and that we're getting notifications, but you can't ne learn those sort of things, I would argue. Um, yeah, so that sums it up. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your very nice talk. I'm Anne Verigo. I am a medical doctor, so I will ask you questions oh about <laughs> <laughs> from end users. <laughs> um, no. I was very impressed. Uh, in fact, I had already read. I had already read in the literature your article about uh, your your the study you did in Germany. Mm. Austria. And, in Austria, in Austria, in Austria. Mm -hmm. and uh, I am impressed about uh, um, all the things that you were allowed to do. I mean, how did you manage with uh, ethical committees, or was it before the, the GDPR regulation? Mm. Uh, because um, I was very impressed that you could, uh, uh, that the, the, the robot could go anywhere in the in the no, nurse, no. nursing home and and see. Uh, the people and and that you could localize where they were uh, because uh, yes. in France, I mean from France, and it it is very difficult. So that is my question: How did you do to manage yeah. with the ethical committee? Because it seems very efficient. Yes. What you so did. first of all, the robot was not allowed to go anywhere. Um, it was only allowed in the public areas of that care home. So it asked sort of where people, where visitors that can come in can go as well. One argument they made is that they have got CCTV there anyway, so we had quite some restrictions of where, how, where we store the data, that it must not leave the site, and that, you know, but, but, uh, sort of um, aspects of that. The other thing, um, so it, it was restrictive where it could go, because initially we wanted to go into the actual residential walls, and we were barred from doing so. So that was not allowed. Uh, the data then we presented also to the uh, relatives, etc. So when, they, when we, sh like the videos that I've shown, were approved through that. Uh, I was honestly also relatively surprised how relaxed they were. Um, you know, there were some constraints, as I said, we didn't go into the, we only stayed in the completely public spaces. I think that's important to mention. And then the robot also did not store, so we had, so the, we don't have any fresh videos anymore, for, like we don't have the videos anymore of the people there, right? So we, it, it's interesting, again, talking about that people need to understand better uh, 
what a robot sees. Everybody was very concerned about the video feed, just the video feed. They were very relaxed about point clouds because it's not a format that the ethics committee was particularly familiar with. When we tell them we're going to we're going to we're going to keep point cloud data, that's fine. <laughs> Weirdly enough, it shouldn't be because I mean that's uh, it carries probably even more information, right, to some extent. Um, but yeah, so because the regulations were very much around video data, that's what they were mostly concerned about. So we don't have these sort of uh, long ROS bags or like the data logs from, from the actual deployment there anymore. We've only got the aggregated data now. So there were some constraints around retention of data uh, and the space that we were allowed to be in. May I ask another question? Uh, and my second question is, uh, uh, I understood that the uh, how about the, the professionals? I understood that w w when there was failures, especially the receptionist was very uh, annoyed with this and furious. But when it worked, did you speak about implementation on the long term? Because, uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, the, the, the rob you have to open the door for, for robots. Yeah. Uh, did they think at the end of the, the, the experimentation, which was quite long, did the, uh, the professional thought uh, did they think that they could have a robot uh, in the nursing home? Did they, the, did they think that it would be possible for them to implement the, the robot in the nursing home? Or did they think that it would be a, uh, an overload? It would be over overwhelming for them? And were they, did you have this kind of implementation thinking about uh, the robot in the nursing home? So, um, the Occupational therapists, as I said, they, they liked the system that mm. we had in place, so they really assessed it quite highly when it was working. You've seen the sort of decline when it mm. wasn't working. Mm. Uh, because they, we've got strong evidence because they kept using it when, they were, when it was open to them to do it, right? Uh, and they said also, oh yeah, it's a shame it leaves now. Mm. Um, because of course it's still sort of keeping, the upkeep of it is something that's quite expensive. I know that there's now a company spun out of the University of Vienna who is taking this sort of serious and wants to kind of carry on with that particular application, let's say. Um, I think the other care home staff said very clearly we, need, we needed to do different tasks. So th this is all nice and it's good, but it's not really solving the jobs that we need it solving. Um, so they are much more interested in physical support. Right? That's very clear. Uh, and so we did this required analysis then, and we did also a post hoc uh, questionnaire with them. So like, you know, yeah, yeah, generally, yeah, it's fine. And we, we got used to it. It wasn't a nuisance to them. So they didn't say like, oh yeah, we can't imagine this being around, but they didn't assess it as particularly useful for their day-to-day -day jobs. <coughs> we have time for one more question. Thanks for your presentation. Uh, I'm wondering about the study that you did in elderly care, mm -hmm. because you mentioned that one group remained engaged, but you didn't do a lot of details because uh, the study was done. But after that, one, is one group remains engaged. Ah, yeah, 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 okay. Uh, oh, gosh, it went past. And now I killed my laptop. Excellent. Um, you meant, God, where was it now? It was here somewhere. There we go. That one. Yeah. That the one, yes. So that was, was uh, so we had, this is, uh, it's not the, the patients, it's not the residents who d uh, did the questionnaire. And, you know, th we didn't have actually ethical approval to uh, engage with them and ask them about that. Uh, it was the therapist, the occupational therapist. There is uh, two in each group and they run this sort of session with the patients. And uh, after every time they have used this robot in the th occupational therapy session, they assessed how well it worked. They assessed it and I need to peek. <laughs> uh, so sort of what effect it had on the sort of overall mood, the motivation and how coherent it was in its behavior. Um, I should put a, the link in there. There's, there's a paper on that one as well. Um, and uh, what we found 
strangely for us was, but it, it's not doesn't measure engagement. It just is an assessment of how the session went after they've done it. And the weird one for us was there was one session which had a massive technical failure. It didn't work. It was abandoned. The robot was stopped and put to the side. But interestingly, the assessment went down from there onwards, even though the system was perfectly working from our point of view. Right? It was doing its job, but because this long-lasting impact of something not working showed its ugly face. So it's not engagement, it's assessment of how well the session went. Yes. Oh, yeah. Out of two, three, four. I don't know, that still wanted to use the ah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so exactly. So, what, yes, when I say that the therapist stayed engaged beyond the scope of this study. So, here it was only looking at seven occurrences, seven sessions. Uh, and after that, because we've done the study, uh, we said, like, well, the robot is still there. You can use it if you want, right? If you want to use it, here's how you can just do it yourself. You go there. Uh, schedule a, a therapy session, you can actually put it in uh, the, the calendar that was shared, so you can put a session in the calendar, and the robot would auto autonomously undock, show up at the starting point for the session, and then the therapist could decide to take it along or not. And if they didn't take it along after 10 minutes, then it would just wander off and do its normal job again. Uh, and they, uh, in most cases, so I've oh, got, got the graph somewhere, about 70% of the sessions after that, for the remainder of the period of the project, the therapist decided to take the robot along, right? It was just there, and if they wanted to do it, they took it. Uh, and for us, the good news was, it, well, they must have seen some value in it because they were not forced to do it anymore. They decided nonetheless to do it. And of course, that was the group that had a better experience <laughs> in the first place. All right, uh, let's thank Mark and Severin again.